in New York. We're right in the middle of our week-long 10th anniversary celebration. And in thinking about some of the things to share with you this week, I stumbled in the archives on a very special morning for me back in 1970. Now, I had been doing the morning show, the early morning show, 6 a.m. to 10, from uh, July of that year. And one of the artists that uh, we started to hear vague rumblings about toward fall was this fellow from England named Elton John. On the strength of the Elton John album in this country, he received a great deal of press attention and uh, came over to appear live, had just done a showcase on the West Coast and something on the East Coast, was preparing for a gig at the Fillmore East, not even as the headliner, Leon Russell, the headline that show. And McKendry Spring was the opening act, Elton John in between somewhere. And it was a week after this broadcast, uh, at a place down the street, where an album called 111770 had its start as a live radio concert in New York City. It is one of my contentions that success changes people, even if it is not visibly, when your lifestyle changes, when you go from anonymity to huge success, there must be residual changes in your life. And what you heard last night on the Dennis Elsa show was Elton John in the throes, in the absolute throes of superstardom, headlining at the Garden a couple of years back with John Lennon stopping by for a guest appearance and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds as a monstrous hit in his career. The Elton John you will listen to this hour as a follow-up to Dennis's program last night is quite a different one, I think you'll agree. This was Elton and Bernie Talpin on a Wednesday morning from about 9.15 until 10 o'clock, trying to make it in the States and visiting with us at WNEW-FM in New York. This is exactly how it went down. That's Elton John and your song at 16 minutes after 9 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. Pete Fornital at WNEW-FM in New York. I was thinking earlier that uh, when you are in a position of presenting music before the public on a seven-day-a-week basis, four hours a day, you really, get, you really get to the point where the things you choose to play at home for your own relaxation are those that stay closest to your heart. And for the last four months or so, in my own particular case, uh, the Elton John album has spent more time gathering mileage on my turntable than any other I can think of. And the reasons for that are probably obvious to, to the people who listen to the station. It is a pleasure to welcome Elton John and Bernie Taupin to our, to our humble surroundings. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, a bright and breezy morning. Good I, morning here from Elton John and Bernie Taupin. I must, I must apologize for the absolute ungodly hour to bring someone before, uh, before our audience. That's why I'd rather pay us $28,000 for this. Well, listen. Uh, <laughs> uh, my God, we left out of bed at three miles an hour. Uh, <laughs> Elton, this is, uh, this is the beginning of what will encompass a lot of personal appearances for you in this mm. country. Is it your first mass exposure to American audiences? Uh, well, it's the first, yeah, the first mass one. We came over about eight weeks ago and did a mini, mini tour. We wasn't really a tour. We played the Troubadour in Los Angeles for a week. And then, then the next week in San Francisco, we played the Troubadour there. And then we came to New York for exposure. <laughs> uh, we in, the, in, the, in the Jim Morrison sense of the word? No, 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 no. <laughs> it was all very decent. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we, we played Philadelphia Electric Factory, which we're playing again this week, folks. <laughs> and then we went home and did about 25 uh, weeks' work in one hour, and then decided to come back. I came back about two weeks ago for holiday to Los Angeles, <laughs> and we played Boston last week, uh, the tea party, which was very good. And um, we're just starting this weekend on our mass, massive campaign to to capture the hearts of the American youth folks, which yeah. will which will take you all uh, all over, the way, yeah. Um, we're going to Philadelphia, Baltimore, Los Angeles, San Francisco, back to New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, Bridgeport, places like that. Um, 
Do you I'm, get to see... And I'm really excited about it. <laughs> no, I really am. <laughs> Do you get to see any of the cities that you visit, or is um, it a hotel well, and stage thing? Well, I know Los Angeles very well. In San Francisco, we stayed there. Because, I mean, like, we stayed in Los Angeles for a week, and we stayed in San Francisco for a week, and that was easy to get to know, really. Uh, Philadelphia, I quite like. Everyone said, you know, everyone goes to sleep in Philadelphia, but I quite liked it. First time I came to New York, I hated it. Really did, you can stand it. But I'm, oh, oh, it's not so bad this time. He said, the Bernie and I wouldn't be walking anyway, seem to attract all the freaks, you know. They sort of <laughs> tap me on the shoulder and ask me for spare change and things like that. And, and <laughs> but people just stand and talk to you at traffic lights and things like that. You think we're friends? You think we're friends? Well, it's a very strange city, but I, I got used to it now. It's, it really takes a while to adjust to New York. Yeah, it is hard for one like myself who has spent all of my life here to identify with what it must, must be like yeah, to come to it, you know. But as I say, we're getting used to it now. I really love, all the cities we've been to have been really friendly, yeah. yeah. All the people have been very nice, yes. And they, and they burn, they've been nice, and they? they right. nice, you're, nice you're lady the other day, nice lady. <laughs> Lots of nice ladies, I'd imagine. <laughs> Especially the ones in Boston. TV in joke, which no one will get. Except David Rosner and Margot Gurian, who might be listening. Perhaps. Perhaps. Bernie, your role, your role in Elton's career is almost, uh, uh, over. Finished when there is a re <laughs> <laughs> revealed first year. Right? That's fine. Seriously though, you have a uh, a function which once a recorded product is is finished, you're almost uh, <coughs> out of the picture. Why aren't you home relaxing? What what is, what is it about the rigors of a live tour that uh, you can't bear to miss out on anything? Right? Is that it? No, it's, I just like being there. You know, I mean, like I, it's true. I don't want to miss out on anything. If, if anything good's going to happen, I want to be there while it's happening. He worries, you see. I mean, I don't worry at all about things. I really, I sort of really don't get sort of worried before I go on stage. I don't get worried about anything. Bernie, sort of, before I go on stage, he sort of loses a handful of hair, goes grey, <laughs> um, has about three babies, and, and sort of usually sits in the back the of, of the dressing room while we're on stage because he can't cope with watching us because he's so nervous. And I really don't get nervous at all. And he's sort of really a, a shivering wreck. By the time I come off stage, he's lost about five stone, you know. Oh. The thing was, I wasn't going to kind of, I was coming on the tour, but I wasn't going to go to all the places, you know. I mean, I was going to stay you can't keep away in, in one kind of place a bit longer. But now it looks like I'll probably kind of end up going everywhere. You know? Do you not have any uh, folks. performing desires of your own? No. Can't say that on the air. <laughs> <laughs> Musically speaking, of course. Of course. Uh, no, not really. I mean, you know, everybody says, isn't it strange that you don't play anything? But I mean, uh, as I always say, if, if, if I played any forms of instruments, uh, you know, we'd probably, we'd probably clash, you know, the musical kind of... Uh, <laughs> How far back does this partnership go? Uh, the bounce of the back of the wall. Yeah, I, think <laughs> I can't move back, back any further because the microphone was in. Um, no, it goes back to three years ago. Um, three years ago. <laughs> three years ago this year. Mm. Oh, oh. Um, three years this year. Um, we've been together now for three years. Um, um, excuse me, we're all guys. It's like healthy and Doris Waters, but you wouldn't get that. Um, three years ago, we... I was playing in a group and Bernie was chopping up wood somewhere or something like that. And uh, <laughs> there was an advert in a paper for songwriters from a record company and talent. Record company needs new talent, so of course I immediately wrote in and so did Bernie. Only Bernie didn't post the letter, he threw it away and his, his mother posted it for him. Which was like, that's how fate takes a hand. And uh, we got together. Uh, I went up to the, well, the record company. He's never talked to me. <laughs> <laughs> Get out, talking. Get out. Um, I'm trying to tell this story, which I've never told before. Oh, you um, interrupt me, I can interrupt you. <laughs> and we, I went up to the record company and said, listen, I can write songs, but I can't write lyrics. And they said, well, this little mangle was written in from the countryside. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so that he'd really like to write lyrics. And uh, so I got together with him. And which I would like. <laughs> and we've been together ever since. The first year and a half, we wrote rubbish, absolute crap. Um, we wrote just bubblegum type stuff, because we had to. We were under pressure from our music publisher. And it was uh, due to a guy called Steve Brown coming that we decided to write our own stuff because he said, you know, do your own thing, baby doll. And we've never written for anybody ever since. We just write for ourselves, you know. And what? Little Brown Bag. We've, you know, we've, we've sort of been writing seriously, really, for about a year and a half now. And it's gradually sort of built up from there. The stuff we wrote before we started writing for ourselves was absolutely appalling, abysmal rubbish. I've never heard anything so bad. 
And we actually, her, my mother keeps all the demos, you know, that so we tied up in velvet ribbons and everything. And she started playing, and, yeah, and just before we came, I just couldn't believe it. We were on oh, heaps, on, heaps on the floor with laughter, you know, some of the things we wrote, we couldn't believe it. It was all, when we started out, it was just the end of the year of the psychedelic canyons of your mind and the lemonade lake bit, you know? And, uh, and oh, it was just unbelievable. So, I think we got ourselves together now, talking. Well, this album, this album literally, literally came out of nowhere with yeah. a tremendous impact in this country. I can't understand it, I really can't, because it wasn't a hit album. It got to 45 in England, which is nothing, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean a thing. Um, and I was on uni, and I really hadn't heard of uni. And people said, oh dear, you're on uni records. What a drag. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I said, oh well, you know, we just had to take the rough of this move. Uh, but they've done an incredible job. They got the album right up the charts. They sold a hell of a lot of albums. And they're really a together company. They've really worked very hard. I can't believe that it's where it is. And I'm knocked out, you know. So. Now, it is probably the most successful uh, album of its kind, which leads me to to the fact that it is one of the most... <laughs> it is very tastefully produced. There is such a tendency when... when uh, when a group of musicians is unleashed upon an album to the degree that I imagine musicians were unleashed on this yeah. one, to so overdo something. But I that is not the case, you know? Now, how uh, do you find a response when you're playing live with just a bass and a drum and yourself on piano? Is there a difference in audience response who are expecting the violins? Yeah, there is. It's great. Uh, when I did the album, people said, oh, you must do an orchestral concert, you know? really suck it to them and do the album on stage with a big orchestra and I said well that would be a completely bad taste it would be a rush job and it would you know it, it's not what I want I'd like to do one but not yet I'm not ready for it and besides if, if, if I did that in England they'd lump me into an orchestra thing and I'd be that would be I'd be a Lawrence Welk for the rest of my life you know yeah. <laughs> so um, I thought no thanks uh, no thanks so I decided to get the band together under great pressure because I didn't want to work and people said well, you have to get a band together so I just said right no guitar piano bass and drums and on stage, we do some of the stuff from the album, but we do it in a completely rearranged way. We have to, you know? Sure. Uh, but it, it comes across very well. People come to see us, do expect to see orchestra, you know? They really do. I can't believe it. Uh, but they go away after I sort of sort of destroyed the piano or set fire to it and, think, and they think, God, you know, I wasn't expecting that. I think American audiences were spoiled by the Bee Gees when they used to tour with an EDP yeah. string set. But they still, you know, that was tastelessly done. And what I'm going to do now is get the funky thing going with the band and everybody will think, all right, Elton John, I'll go and see him in his band and I'm going to do an orchestral concert next year. That must be a, an exciting part of the whole success syndrome to have other people as well as yourself interpret the things that the two of you, two of you have done. Have it, you... Can, it can be exciting, it can also be absolutely frustratingly or painful. Would well, you like to uh, mention examples of either kind? Or... Uh, no, I, I do. No, I, we've had some very... Three Dog Night have done a couple of things which have been adequate and they've admitted that they've been adequate. They, they, they discovered us over here really. They were the people that sort of brought our songs to the American public and we're very grateful to them. Uh, Lady Samantha, they did very well. Uh, your song, they did I, very strangely. Um, but they really, they the people that discovered us. They took our stuff back with them and they were, they've been really great to us, you know. Uh, Rod Stewart did a... a a good version of Country Comfort only got the words wrong, but his voice is too much. Um, who else? Who else? Aaron? I can't think of his uh, um, no, 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 not that one. There's been some other adequate versions. Well, this one looks to uh, be one at I'm least. Toe Fat wasn't bad. Oh, that's that really true. That was about the only, uh, the only thing I liked on their album. Sure. This one looks to be one that, uh, that commercially at least will do quite this, well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, this is the first record that's ever been down of ours that I've been sort of up in the air about. I really oh, yeah, well, It's a compliment and a half, you know. Okay, far out, let's get into it. This is Aretha Franklin and the <coughs> song. Uh, Holy Moses. 